Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Great. Um, so you got to hear a little bit about me. I'm the second oldest of six kids, come from a large Catholic family, grew up Catholic. Um, my siblings all still practice, so it's really pretty remarkable. And I'm mother of those three boys aged four and younger. So needless to say that I run all day long from the time I wake up until the time they go to bed. And that's most of my, most of my day, chasing after little boys. Um, I also am married to Dr. Kevin Stewart, um, who is the executive director at the Austin Institute for the Study of Family and Culture. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about how I came to this particular topic. Back in 2016, my husband and I had just moved to UT, <laughs> moved to UT, moved to Austin, and <laughs> started getting involved with some of the you know, UT campus ministers. And so uh, I had given some brief presentation at the Austin Institute. What we do is we look at how social science informs a lot of these things that we're talking about today. So my approach is gonna be a little bit different because it's gonna be based on scientific studies almost exclusively. That's what you're gonna hear. Um, so I was approached in 2016 by a campus minister who said, uh, do you have any resources that you can give me? Because the college students that I work with, they're always asking questions about sexuality and gender. And I feel like I don't even know the first thing about them. And yet I have to advise them and I'm trying to guide them. So what in the world do I use? And I said, you are in luck because uh, this sort of a summary of the literature on sexuality and gender has just come out. And I'll tell you how you can get a copy. He got a copy, I think I even mailed him one. Um, and then I started reading it and I realized Wow, <laughs> the language was just so specialized. I thought this campus minister is never going to be able to have the time or the tools to be able to sort of break down what these studies are actually saying. So this is what launched me into a project beginning in 2016 and continuing out now on to today where my job is to sort of translate research into um, a form that's more accessible to non-specialists. So you'll see on these slides that I pull up, I'm gonna be citing a whole bunch of different studies. Um, I have citations wherever I can so that you know that that's what it's grounded in. Everything in this presentation is grounded in actual scientific studies. Um, so that's how I came to this topic. My, uh, top, my title here, Gender Dysphoria Separating Fact from Fiction, um, that's largely what I'll be doing. I'm gonna have six different statements that we often hear and we'll be looking at how we can try to tease apart fact from fiction, um, looking through the lens of science. Like what does science have to say about each of these statements in response to each of these statements? So I first want to define terms because um, every academic <laughs> wants to always define terms before we begin. What is gender dysphoria? What are we talking about? Um, gender dysphoria is when there's a division a rift um, between the way that someone perceives him or herself, perception or the innermost sense of oneself is what it's also called. There's a division between that and then the bodily reality. So there's some type of division, a huge rift in the interior of the person between how they perceive themselves and then their biological sex, their bodily reality. Um, this causes great pain for a lot of individuals, I and mean, you can imagine what that must feel like to feel this division in the very core of your being. Because Father Jonathan talked about how, according to Catholic teaching, um, body and soul go together. So you can imagine to feel like they don't, like they're at odds with each other. This causes a great deal of pain and suffering. And so I want to start with that statement because I think that Father Joseph and Father Jonathan were both very good about saying we can't forget the people. <laughs> we can't sort of get lost, like trying to politicize things. We can't, when we do that, we lose sight of the people. So let's always remember the people um, who experience these things before we start discussing them. Um, and so these are the people that we're talking about. Statement number one, then. People who experience gender dysphoria should be treated with compassion and respect. And that is absolutely factual. <laughs> they should, people who experience gender dysphoria should be treated with compassion and respect. And you know, I, even thinking back, uh, Father Joseph was so good about saying, you know, some of these things, you know, walking and accompanying the people that, um, that you get to minister to, 
Like you start to realize that we have these shared experiences and um, that we're all, we're all humans walking together and brothers and sisters in Christ. And thinking back to my own life, um, just dealing with uh, aspects of gender nonconformity, as a young girl, I so badly wanted to be a boy. And I, I can't forget the look of shock on my mother's face. We'd gone to Six Flags over Texas, and she said she was taking all of us kids into the bathroom before we were let loose in the park. And she said, um, now remember, you know, what every mother says to her daughter, remember, don't sit down on the seat <laughs> because it could be dirty. And I remember telling her, this little kid, I said, that's okay, I can stand. Because I'd actually taught myself, I wanted how to stand <laughs> whenever I went to the bathroom. I so wanted to be a boy. I never, it was hard for me to connect with other same-sex peers when I was a small child. And then when puberty hit, good Lord, I hated it, you know. I, I hated every moment of it. And I think that this is an experience that a lot of females they've experienced some degree of this, like mine was mild, never progressed to full-blown gender dysphoria, but it gives me something to root myself in, to remember again the people and the, and the, the difficulties that this causes. So people who experience gender dysphoria should be treated with compassion and respect, absolutely. Statement number two, gender identity is immutable and trans people are born that way. Um, this is actually two statements. I'm going to divide this up into two. Now remember, what I'm doing is I'm taking the statements that we often hear, and I'm just trying to say, what do the scientific studies have to say about this? Um, how can science perhaps shed light on some of these statements? Because there is a lot of misinformation that's running around, and so I just want to help to dispel it, <laughs> clear it out, so that we can start talking about truths, things rooted in truths, actual scientific observations, rather than in um, just sort of ideology. Okay, so gender identity is immutable, that means it's unchangeable, and trans people are born that way. Let's see what the science has actually revealed about that. First statement, 2A, gender identity is immutable, meaning that it doesn't change. Um, the vast majority of the studies show that there is actually a lot of changeability when it comes to gender identity. This one particular study is a 2021 study, so it's extremely recent, and it's one of the studies that followed a group of people, these were men in this case, they presented at a gender identity clinic when they were boys, and it followed them to 13 years later to see, okay, well, where are you now? They just followed up with them to see where they were. And what they actually found was that 13 years after their original assessment, 88% of those men were classified as D-sisters. So you're either a per-sister, meaning you persist um, with your, uh, your atypical gender identity, um, either you persist or you desist. And this is a pretty high number that over the course of 13 years, 88% of these boys or young men ended up actually um, desisting, um, whatever that gender identity was. Now, other studies, one of the leaders in, who's done a lot of research on this, especially with children, her name is Peggy cohen Catenis, and her range was 85 to 95% of people desisted. Um, the largest range on the lowest end, they say 61% will desist. On the highest end, the numbers are closer to about 98%. So the point here is that there's actually a lot of desistance. There's a lot of mutability when it comes to gender identity and to feelings of gender dysphoria. There's a lot of change that's recorded, science has recorded. So that's statement number one. Statement number two, trans people are born that way. And again, I'm, I'm using the vernacular, um, vernacular kinds of statements. Um, well, they've done studies into this, into, well, is it something that you're just born with? And they typically look at two things. They look at genes, um, and they've come up with contradictory um, conclusions, con contradictory evidence. Some studies say, well, maybe this is the genetic key to gender dysphoria, and others are saying, no, that's not it. Maybe it's this, and so you, we've just ended up having a whole bunch of conflicting studies over that. Um, what the consensus seems to be is that it is more environmental than genetic. 
So it seems to, see, it seems to be that there's some genetic predisposition, um, which we will very often find with sexual orientation too. There's some genetic predisposition, um, but majority of that kind of, when you see that kind of behavior, majority of the influence is gonna be environmental rather than genetic. And they're finding the same things when it comes to gender identity, is that there might be some genetic predisposition, but the environmental factors are often the ones that are um, more seriously doing the work. Um, okay, so that's genes. What about brains? Again, they've looked into brain structure. Are the brain structures of people who identify as trans, are they different than the brain structures of people who are cisgender, who identify as cisgender? Um, and what they found are contradictions. <laughs> One study contradicting another. And so they really, it's been inconclusive because they haven't been able to really zero in on any part of the brain that determines somebody's gender identity. They haven't been able to find that. And so right now, the evidence is still inconclusive. And the best we can say is that there might be some genetic predisposition, but that that's not, it doesn't determine future behaviors because there's this huge environmental component, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. So if it's not purely, simply genetic, then what else could cause gender dysphoria? And I use cause here um, with this huge caveat. Um, social scientists are very leery about saying one thing causes another. So when I bring up these things, these are just things, and this is based on three different studies. I'm just pulling stuff from three different studies and what they have found. These are three things that they've noticed whenever somebody comes in who's experiencing gender dysphoria, it's very often accompanied by these things in high numbers. They keep finding these things too, present too. Number one, unresolved trauma. What do we mean by that? Um, assault, some type of assault. There's some unresolved trauma that they're dealing with. Um, and loss, very often this is the loss of a parent through divorce or through death. That something happened there, there was a loss and this triggered this gender dysphoria. And so they find this quite often. Um, family conflict, so what do I mean by that? Um, it could be a sick sibling. It could be functional problems within the family. Um, there was this one story about um, uh, this little boy who presented at a gender identity clinic and uh, this mother brought him in and the, the psychologist who was working with this little boy started asking questions about what was going on in the family and said, um, well, tell me, when, when is it that he wants to cross dress? And she said, every night. And he said, what's going on at night? And she said, well, I work nights. And he said, so that's when he wants to dress like a girl? And she said, yes. And so the psychologist said, why don't you call him before, when you get to work and then right before he goes to bed? And then let's see what happens. So she started calling him and the cross-dressing behaviors ceased. They went away because this was in his child's head. Like this was his way to connect with his mother so that he felt safe before he went to bed. And so you can see there are all kinds of, so when I say functional problems within the family, I'm not even blaming anybody. This mother had to work nights. But sometimes there's something going on within the family, they keep seeing this, that ends up um, going along with gender, the gender dysphoria. Um, parents' mental illness, this is also pretty high. Um, a Canadian researcher found that 75% uh, of the parents of kids who came in had one or more psychiat psychiatric diagnoses. So let me give you an example of that because again, we're not blaming anyone. Um, there was this one woman who had been sexually assaulted as a child and she was a single mom. She'd never really dealt with that herself. And so without meaning to, um, they found out as they went through therapy together, she started dealing with some of these issues, the feelings of being vulnerable, afraid of men, hating men. She started dealing with some of those and her son's cross-dressing behavior um, disappeared. What was going on there? She didn't mean to because she loved her son, but you can't help, she was spilling over, that unresolved trauma was spilling over into her interactions with her son. And so when they were able to deal with the trauma, then the cross-dressing behaviors ended up disappearing. Um, so these things happen all the time. That's why I'm bringing up um, these particular other possibilities. Um, poor attachments, so poor attachment to peers. 
you know, what I said before, I never felt like I had those same sex peers who were my tight buddies. Um, sometimes this goes hand in hand very often with some kind of gender dysphoria. Um, autism, very high rates of autism among those who experience gender dysphoria. Um, peer groups among girls, if their peer group comes out as trans or non-binary, um, the likelihood that they will come out is increased exponentially. So the influence of peer groups and then other psychiatric illnesses. Let me get into that because this is what they've seen most often or other psychiatric illnesses. Um, I have two studies that are cited here. This one is from 2015. Um, they found that 75% of adolescents applying for sex reassignment surgery needed help for psychiatric problems other than gender dysphoria. Another study in 2021 showed that 89% needed such help. So when I say we don't know if it's a cause, but it does seem to show up really often, um, this is what I'm talking about, that those who are presenting with gender dysphoria often have these other psychiatric illnesses and what doctors are increasingly starting to ask is, hey, wait a minute, um, why don't we see if we can deal with these other psychiatric illnesses first and see if that affects those feelings of gender dysphoria? It seems fairly logical. And what are the ones that appear most often? Depression, anxiety, PTSD. These are the ones that appear most often. So I want you to hear from someone. Um, her name is Kira Bell. Um, and this is what she has to say. Uh, she transitioned to living as a, a male and then detransitioned back to living as a female. She said, the further my transition went, the more I realized that I wasn't a man and never would be. We are told these days that when someone presents with gender dysphoria, this reflects a person's real or true self, that the desire to change genders is set, but this was not the case for me. As I matured, I recognized that gender dysphoria was a symptom of my overall misery, not its cause. And so doctors are starting to question, and when people come in and they present in these gender identity clinics, and they're saying, I just need to go through the treatments, I just need to go through the treatments, they're starting to question, is it because there are these other things that they're dealing with that they just don't feel like they can bear anymore? Like, are they trying to get over these psychiatric things and they think that this will solve, solve my problems? This will, this will be the answer. And then when it doesn't, which often happens several years, like eight to 10 years down the road, then they're, and they're distraught. <laughs> thrown into despair like Kira Bell was when she realized, oh my gosh, if I just dealt with the misery before, then maybe I wouldn't have had all of these irreversible effects because I can't go back to what I was before. Okay, uh, statement number three, most people who experience an atypical gender identity are adult males. I don't know if people still think this. Do any of you, have you heard this? Like when you're, thinking about people who are trans adult males. This used to be the case about 10 years ago, <laughs> um, but over the course of about 10 years, um, it went from having three males to every one female who identified as uh, gender atypical or as trans to the reversal. Three females for every one male over the course of 10 years, which is very, very short. And so this is just to show you graphically what they've seen over the past 10 years. Um, this is data from the UK. They only have one gender identity clinic in the UK. So it's really easy to go gather all the data on one country because they don't have like 60, which is what we have here. Um, so they're able to gather a whole snapshot of a whole country in the UK. And what they found was this. Prior to about, like right here, you saw a huge uptick in 2013 and 2014. The gray and the black down here are males. And then this blue is females. And you can see right around 2014, 2015, suddenly we had this huge explosion of females, mostly 12 or over, who are identifying as trans or as non-binary. So let's look at another chart that shows this data from the UK and actually takes it by age. These were all the referrals, boys and girls. But you can see how not huge numbers here down in the younger grades, but right around 12, we start to see an uptick, 14, 
15, 16, and then back down again, 17 and 18. And you start, you start thinking, you know, what's going on in a young woman's life? 13, 14, 15, 16. What? <laughs> yes, that there's this distress um, that is accompanying the onset of puberty and those, you know, breasts and periods and all this other kind of stuff that's very distressing to some of these young women. I mean, it's scary for most girls, but for some, like, it, it's crippling. It's crippling and causes this sense of hating your body. And so uh, there's, this is where they're seeing the uptick, though. And this is another reason why a lot of scientists are going, whoa, 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 whoa. The numbers are totally changing. Like, shouldn't we wait and see if there's something different going on with this group first um, before we just barrel ahead with the same therapies that we were using on boys who presented when they were three or four? So there are lots of questions that are going on in um, the medical community. So this brings us to number four, statement number four. The consensus of the scientific community is that the best way to deal with gender dysphoria is through gender affirming therapies. Let's look at what the studies say. So first of all, we define our terms. What do we mean when we're talking about gender affirming therapies? I apologize for the size of the font. Um, so I'll tell you what this says actually. Um, what they're talking about largely is this protocol that was adopted by some Dutch scientists it's called a Dutch protocol. Um, they were dealing with mostly boys who had presented from a very young age who had received a whole bunch of psychiatric treatments. Um, nothing seemed to be working. And so they proposed, perhaps there's some sort of protocol we could use for people in that unique set of circumstances. So they said, how about we have the kid go that, to a gender identity clinic. Um, the clinician determines whether or not that kid has gender dysphoria. And then that kid can either go home and just see what happens, or they can, can start down this path for gender affirming um, therapy, of gender affirming therapies, which often begins with social transition. And then puberty suppression beginning at the age of 12, cross sex hormones administered at 16, and sex reassignment surgery occurring at 18. So this was the protocol that they established uh, just to see how it might work. So it was somewhat experimental when they established it. Um, well, let's take a look. What happens at each of those stages? So I'm gonna remind you, puberty suppression at 12, uh, cross-sex hormones at 16, and then sex reassignment surgery at 18. What have they found since then are some of the effects of each of those steps? We're gonna start with puberty blockers, so puberty suppressing drugs. Some of the effects are reduced stature, so they don't achieve the same kind of height because remember, you're arresting puberty. So you're keeping those bones and those muscles from growing. You're stopping it. So they found reduced stature, um, possible infertility, um, reduced bone density. This is interesting. Um, what do we mean by that? Well, again, if you're stopping that surge of hormones that you get at puberty that's supposed to continue your development into the full, your, you know, your full body, we're stopping that, what they were finding is that their bones became increasingly fragile. So they had several fractures, mostly in the pelvis and in the spine. Um, there was one kid who went on puberty blockers at 12 and by the age of 16, he'd had four fractures, which would actually qualify him for a diagnosis of having osteoporosis at the age of 16. So these are some of the effects um, that we, that can occur with the use of those um, puberty blocking drugs. Uh, well, what about the cross sex hormones? Um, some of the side effects of cross sex hormones are blood clots, stroke, heart attacks, diabetes, acne, which when you think about the others doesn't seem to be, <laughs> <you know. laughs> okay. Um, infertility, and then for those who receive testosterone, increased aggression. Uh, so for these biological females who are receiving testosterone, you see increased ing aggression in them, which in the UK studies, they said actually um, resulted in increased mental health problems because suddenly they had all this aggression and didn't know what to do with, do with it. And so they had worse, it worsened some of their mental health problems. So there are some problems there with cross-sex hormones. We're gonna take questions in just a little. 
And then uh, sex reassignment surgery, there's the fact that it's irreversible. So like for Kira Bell, you know, and other girls like her, they said, like, I, I didn't realize then that I might want to have children someday. And so I went through with it, and now I can never do that. And it's really tragic when you think about some of those, some of those um, young women. So I want to take a look real quickly at these persistence rates. Now, we said before that according to that one study, 88% of the boys who had just been allowed to go all the way through puberty into adulthood no longer had these strong um, feelings of gender dysphoria. They no longer had it. So only 12% persisted. For those who went down the gender-affirming therapy route, 98% persisted. And so it makes you wonder, if these had not gone down that route, down that path, could they perhaps have been among these? And it's, it's a real challenge that within the medical community they're really trying to work out right now. Well, what about social transition? Uh, there was a study um, done by Steensma. So Steensma was one of the scientists who actually co-authored the original Dutch protocol. So I'm not handpicking sources here. I'm actually using some of the major researchers. And Steensma said that patients who had made a partial or complete gender social transition prior to puberty were more likely to persist. So there's something even about social transition that makes it more likely, increases the chances that that person will be more likely to persist in their gender dysphoria. All right, uh, so let's come back to this, this whole idea of the consensus of the scientific community is that the best way to deal with gender dysphoria is through gender affirming therapies. Um, this is, there's a, a lot of heated debate going on within the medical communities, within the scientific community. So it's not like everyone has reached this happy consensus and there are just these few naysayers here and there. No, there's heated, debate going on right now. Um, so this is not exactly true. And what has changed some of these scientists' minds? Um, well, you have hundreds of doctors urging caution now when it comes to early transitions because of the increasing number of detransitioners like Kira Bell, um, like Sinead Watson. This is Sinead Watson, biological female, transitioned to living as a male, and then transitioned back. We were led to believe that our best chance of treating our dysphoria was to medically transition. As it turned out, this was not the case. As a result, we now have to live with bodies and voices that have been irreversibly changed, in some cases damaged by hormones and surgeries, when what we needed was a compassionate and thoughtful exploration of our gender distress through talk therapy. Some of us will now never be able to have children, and many of us live with great distress and regret every day, is what Sinead has said. Um, they're also urging caution because of the fact that the brain doesn't mature until 25 in most cases. So they're starting to question, can a kid who's 12 give consent if his brain isn't yet mature and it's not gonna mature until 25? Um, and then finally, European countries are increasingly limiting these procedures. Like laws are being implemented in European nations because they're like, whoa, 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 lawsuits. Like they're so afraid of lawsuits all over the place that they're actually limiting these procedures. In some places, you have to have a court order in order to be able to go through the, have the gender affirming therapies. Um, so again, this shows that the opinions are changing. Okay, um, fifth statement, we only have six. We have two more to go. Gender affirming care is evidence-based. This too is, there are problems with this statement. Um, there was actually an organization, the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine, that formed because they kept seeing that these therapies were being undertaken without a very firm scientific basis. It wasn't really evidence-based, and so they formed an organization in order to review all the literature and to say, okay, this is evidence-based, this is not evidence-based. And uh, what is it that they concluded about a lot of, about this, these gender-affirming therapies? They said they were using low-quality evidence. So in some cases, um, they took a group of 27 people and then a, said, and so this is what would be true for everyone and the whole population. 27 people is an extremely small sample size. Um, next, they were using studies about people who experience uh, same-sex attraction and they were applying those results to the people who experienced gender dysphoria. These two things are not the same things, but they were using those studies and then just applying them. 
um, experimentally. Uh, next, they found that 30 to 50% of patients were disappearing or unavailable for follow-up after they'd gone through the sex reassignment surgeries. If we're losing 30 to 50% of the people who have gone through the surgeries, then we're not getting a clear picture of what happens to people after they go through all of those gender affirming therapies. 30 to 50% of them are missing. And so this should cause us to say, hey, wait a minute here. Um, next, uh, there were earlier studies that they were applying to change circumstances. So primarily boys, young, versus primarily girls, teenagers. They're not apples to apples. And so you can't just apply those. And then data was being collected too soon. So they would ask them, hey, how do you feel about your, your uh, gender reassignment surgery? They'd ask them six months later. Now they've often found that after somebody maybe makes the social transition, there are these feelings of euphoria. And then you realize a, a little while in that that wasn't enough, and so you need to take the next step, you know, which might be um, the puberty blockers or the cross-sex hormones, and so you keep going in after the honeymoon period goes away. You had this euphoria, and now things are bad again because the same problems are resurfacing. And so what they were doing is they were asking people six months after, or up to two years after they had, had gone all the way through gender reassignment surgery, they were asking them, so how do you feel about it? And they're like, I'm feeling fine because it was only six months away, six months out or two years out. But they found that when they followed up eight years out or 10 years out, the picture was very different. People had disappeared. People were having major physical problems. People were having major psychological problems. And they were also seeing high rates of suicide. So this is another thing. This is one thing to keep in mind when you hear gender affirming care is evidence-based. Even under Obama, our uh, HHS, our Health and Human Services Department, they conducted a review of all of this research to see if insurance carriers could cover these treatments. And this is what the HHS found. In 2016, they conducted a systematic review of evidence for gender-affirming surgeries in adults. The review found the clinical evidence is inconclusive for the benefits of surgery and cautioned we cannot exclude therapeutic interventions, hormones, and surgeries as a cause of the observed excess morbidity and mortality. So what does that mean? They said, this evidence isn't very good. And number two, we can't even tell if maybe going through the entire transition could be causing the mortality, the increased mortality. We can't tell. So they refuse to cover it. So the HHS has already looked at this and said, too, that there's just not great evidence. Okay, statement number six, gender affirming care is life-saving. If people don't start transitioning, they will commit suicide. So again, let's look at what the evidence actually says. Um, what we find here is that suicide attempts and rates among those who are experiencing gender dysphoria are about equal to suicide attempts and rates among people who are experiencing those other psychiatric problems. So let's say here we have someone with gender dysphoria who also has um, depression, anxiety, PTSD. And here we have someone who has depression, anxiety, PTSD in the same, at the same levels. Those people are about equally likely to commit suicide according to, to scientific studies. And so you start to wonder what's doing the work there? Is it the psychiatric problems? Um, or is it really that having gender dysphoria and it not being treated is what causes the suicide. There are lots of questions about this. Um, the Swedish National Board of Health and Welfare said that suicide mortality rates are higher among people with gender dysphoria compared to the general population. You know what, I think this says basically what I just said just now. Um, there's a doctor, and people have begun to suspect, you know, they started to call it the suicide narrative because when, especially an adolescent girl, comes out to her parents, she very often, there's one researcher, Lisa Lippman, who charted that she almost immediately starts talking about suicide. So I need to get these treatments, you need to take me in, or I'm gonna commit suicide. So this very often, parents were reporting this again and again. And it's interesting, they actually caught um, one of these uh, gender identity doctors, um, clinic doctors, um, in undercover video. I know those aren't so popular these days, but an undercover video, this is what he said. His name was Dr. Uh, Wallace Wong. He wrote this book, 
when Kathy is Keith, he's a practicing um, psychologist in Vancouver. And they caught him on tape saying, so what you need is, you know what? Pull a stunt, suicide, every time. Then they'll give you what you need. Gender dysphoric kids learn that. They learn it very, very fast. So there's something going on here um, that we should just put out in the open. <laughs> this, is, this is trying to see what is the truth. What is the truth? So, so that we can proceed, proceed in the truth. Um, because ultimately, um, that's what will bring the greatest happiness. So this is the very last um, slide that I want to show you. It's suicide risk. I mentioned this before, that those who had undergone sex reassignment surgery, um, they found that they were still 19.1 times more likely to die by suicide than the general population. And this is after going through all of the treatments that, were, that they thought, at least, would get rid of the problems that they were facing. They thought they'd be free of them, of all that turmoil. Okay, so let's review these six statements and then talk a little bit about compassion. Um, where is the compassion in all this? Review them. People who experience gender dysphoria should be treated with compassion and respect. Don't need to go over that one. Um, number two, where's the compassion in this? So he said that gender identity is actually fairly mutable and that there's no clear um, proof that trans people are born that way. So how, where's the compassion in that? Um, it's in giving our researchers permission to look at what's currently going on um, with those who are identifying as gender dysphoric because it's easy to check it off. Well, it's genetic, it's in the brain, done. But that doesn't address what's really going on. So we should be able to look at what's actually going on because then people's lives will be saved. Once we start looking at the truth, people's lives will be saved. Now, what about the third? Most people who experience an atypical gender identity are adult males. Um, no, <laughs> again, that's just a, a misconception. Um, so even with these others, I'll just go through and show you where all the compassion is in all of these. What are some other things we can do? We can give kids the chance to desist. Give them the chance to desist rather than locking them into this gender affirming treatment plan where there are only 2% of them desist. Give them the chance. We can demand that treatments be evidence-based rather than experimental because the stakes are really high. We're talking about uh, changes that can't be reversed, irreversible changes. We can take the threat of suicide seriously, but we should not perpetuate it because it's totally irresponsible to plant in people's heads the necessity of suicide if they don't get the treatment that they want. That's irresponsible. So there's a great deal of compassion present in just airing the truth <laughs> of these narratives to say these narratives are actually not true. Um, there's, there's misinformation. And let's get the right information out there so we can actually start treating these root causes rather than just putting patches, patches on these hurting people. We can't do that. So I began with this exhortation that we remember the people. We remember the people behind um, all of these stats, behind all the politics. Let's remember the people. And so what I want to do is I want to end with a story of a conversation I had with a young woman who was suffering from uh, gender dysphoria. I had just given a talk at a university about gender identity to a group of college students. Um, when this girl, she was dressed kind of mask, you know, this mask looking girl, and she asked afterward if, if she could ask me some questions. And so of course I went over there and she said she was struggling with whether or not she was trans. And so I said, okay, well tell me more about that. <laughs> What's your story? I thought that was so great. So I asked her why she thought she was and she said she didn't feel like she belonged with the other girls. And I said, yeah, I hear you. And then she said she also wanted to join the military and maybe work with dogs. And I said, those are great ambitions, you know, which, you know, aren't limited to one sex or the other. And that's awesome that you want to do that. And then we talked about um, my children, and she asked to see the pictures. And it really touched me because I, I wanted to tell her this, but I didn't want to sound too preachy. But as she was looking through the pictures, she was being, the way she did it was so feminine because women have this ability to enter into somebody else's experience and to be excited alongside them. 
and she's going through my pictures and she's like, oh my gosh, that looks so great. And I'm just like, yes, this is beautiful, like right here, you know? This is, this is you, this is you, and I see you, and it's, it's beautiful to see. And then she asked something that I thought was a really hard question. She said, what if I, had, I never stop feeling like my body isn't right? And this is when, I mean, it's tough. And um, I didn't know what to say with her, to her, so I shared with her something that a friend of mine who experienced the same sex attraction and is living as a celibate, something that he told me. And what he taught me was that when God doesn't take away um, some pain or struggle, um, he meets us right there, like in the midst of it. And that it's sometimes those things are deepest injuries where we're so raw that he's able to come in and, and minister to us most intimately. And so you might never feel like your body is the right one. You might not, but this is an opportunity too, like through that pain, to have the most profound relationship with Christ in that space, in that hurt, hurt, damaged space. So I, I thought that she was going to get mad at me, but she didn't. Like, she just sort of relaxed. And I thought, wow. <laughs> that's sort of, that's the power of the truth. Like, just being able to speak the truth, even when it's not what somebody, you think somebody wants to hear. So, um, I do want to end with a quick prayer. And then, uh, I don't know what our time looks like. Is that it? Time to wrap up? Okay. Uh, we'll end with a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we come to you with open hearts and open ears. And I grant that you would give us the humility to see what is true, the courage to speak it, and the prudence to know how to remain grounded in the truth without sacrificing one bit of charity and compassion. Open our hearts and help us to see. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay.